Welcome, beloved soul seekers of this USU community. Thank you for being here. You are in for the most incredible treat today. I urge you to make some time, get your paper and pen ready. Uh, you are about to, to meet one of my uh, biggest inspirational guides, mentors. I, I'm a huge fan and I'm so, so honored. You're going to get to meet Greg Braden today. Let me tell you about Greg. Greg is a five-time New York Times bestselling author, researcher, educator, lecturer, and internationally renowned as a pioneer bridging modern science spirituality, and human potential. From 1979 to 1991, Greg worked as a problem solver during times of crisis for Fortune 500 companies, including Cisco Systems, where he became the first technical operations manager in 1991. He continues problem solving today as he merges modern science and the wisdom of our past to reveal real world solutions to the issues that challenge our lives. His research has led to 15 film credits and 12 award-winning books now published in over 40 languages. Greg is a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, and is active with visionary organizations, including the HeartMath Global Coherence Initiative, we love HeartMath, and the Arlington Institute. He has presented his discoveries in over 30 countries on six continents and has been invited to speak to the United Nations, Fortune 500 companies, and the US military. The United Kingdom Watkins Journal lists Greg among the top 100 of the world's most spiritually influential living people for the sixth consecutive year. And he has a 2020 nominee for the prestigious Templeton Award, established mm. to honor outstanding individuals who have devoted their talents to expanding our vision of human purpose and ultimate reality. I am so honored to have you here today, Greg. You, between the Divine Matrix, Secrets of the Lost Mode of Prayer, and so many other of your works, Missing Links, like such an honor to have you. Thank you for being here. Oh, Julie Wyland, thank you. First, thank you for making the time. My pleasure. Okay, we, we just, uh, I just saw I had a slow internet connection, so I paused for a moment. Thank you for making the time to have me today. Thank you for having this platform uh, for us to, to have this conver conversation with, uh, with your community. Uh, I think it's always good to have the conversations. I think right now it's vital yeah. to, to have community and to reach out community because we are in the midst of an unprecedented global lockdown. Uh, we just got the statistics. Right now, a third of planet Earth is under a, um, a shelter in place. Mm. Uh, almost 2 billion people, a little over, over it's uh, very close to 2 billion people right now are locked down in a way that we've never seen, unprecedented in, in human history. So uh, I think it's good that we talk about this a little bit today. It's a dance. I'm going to follow your lead wherever you'd like to go. You know, I, I have a lot of questions, so I'm, I'm going to try to reel this in. But, you know, I um, loved, I recommend The Divine Matrix um, to everyone, uh, all of your Thank books. You. I just, that, you. Woo, and the, the 20 keys. And I, I, for those that haven't read it, and I, maybe you could just... Is there a way to tie in what you teach about the divine matrix and and how that how that connects to what's happening now? Like, how are they connected? Maybe your thoughts on yeah. I'll let you take that. We'll start there. Well, it, I um, <laughs> I'm going to start. I, I did an interview recently, and and I, I may have mentioned this to you before. I did an interview where the interviewer began by asking me why I couldn't stay with one topic like uh like many other authors he said man you are all over the place he's a little hostile about it you know he says greg Braden, why can't you stay with one topic like everybody else he said you're all over the place you know are you writing about the human heart are you writing about our origins are you writing about spirituality or science are you writing about patterns and cycles of time in ancient civilizations and what are you writing about and i, I was i was surprised by the question i wasn't expecting it and, uh, and I do, I think he was surprised by my answer because what I said <clears throat> was if you look closely, every one of those books uh, explores one facet of our relationship to the earth, to our own experience, to one another. And in a very real sense, I have stayed with one topic. It's a big topic. It's us and our relationship to life. The Divine Matrix was one of those books. And it was, uh, it was written in 07, it was released in 08. 
And the Divine Matrix, it was actually very healing for me to write that book because it gave me the opportunity uh, and, and the license to take the time to bring together in, in, under the covers of one book many and disparate uh, rock-solid scientific discoveries supporting the fact that we are connected in ways that we're only beginning to understand from a scientific perspective. Now, intuitively, we probably sense that. Our indigenous ancestors have always told us that. We're one, you know, we're in the web of life. And those have been metaphors and, and poetic descriptions. And the science is telling us uh, now that it goes beyond that, that it is a, a physical, a digital reality. And it's not that there's a field out there and that somehow we relate to it. But rather, it is that we are the field that the field is emerging and collapsing in every second of our life through each atom of our existence. We are emerging and collapsing into this undulating field of this mysterious energy. And that's a big idea to wrap our minds around. The book gave me the opportunity to bring that information together. It was considered fringe in 2008. It is now required reading in, uh, in university physics classes and their entire courses uh, based upon this book, The Divine Matrix. So that's how fast mm. things change. So, so it, it said to us that we are not just that we are connected, but that we are the field. Right. And I think that's important because of, of what's happening right. uh, in, in, in the world right now. I, I just want, I, we'll go anywhere you want to go and I'm happy to do that. But what I want to say to our listeners right now, in case we run out of time, I want to say in this pandemic, in this global COVID-19 shutdown yeah. uh, is that we are made for times just like this. Our bodies are literally wired, not just to survive, but to thrive, to transcend what has, has come to our doorstep. And we're not hearing that in the mainstream. We're not hearing that mainstream classrooms, textbooks, mainstream media or daily news conferences. And, and I think this is, if there is a gift, that can come from this. For the first time in a long time, we are now severed from the diversions and the distractions that have kept us away from ourselves in the past. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not gonna judge them as right, wrong, good or bad. We all have had very full lives, including myself, travel, preparations for speaking at conferences, after the conferences, interviews, media, all those things. We don't have that right now. And so what's happening is people are now forced to come to terms with themselves. And for some people, it's a, it's a frightening prospect. But the, I think the question that we're all being asked, we are made, we are literally made, and we have been on this earth for 200,000 years with the capacity to deal with exactly what we're having happen to us right now. We have had contagions in our bodies for 200,000 years, and our bodies know what to do if they are given, if our bodies are given what we need to be at our best. And so I think that the central question that some people will consider esoteric or philosophical, and for me, it's, this is based in rock solid science, and we can talk about it. Yeah. But we're asking ourselves, do we love ourselves enough mm. to give ourselves what we need to be at our best in the presence of the threat that is now at our doorstep. Yeah. A lot of people are in fear right now, Julie, and, and the fear, I'll just be very, very honest. The fear is they're afraid they're going to die. The fear is that they will die from this very potent virus that's new to the human body. The reason they have that fear is because they have been taught not to trust in the wisdom and the intelligence of the human body. We have been taught that we are somehow weak as a species, we're weak as individuals. And what's gonna happen? At some point, hopefully in the not too distant future, all of our restrictions are gonna be lifted. And we're gonna emerge into a new world. The beauty is that world doesn't exist right now. We're building it by the way we respond to what is happening right now. That world is a potential, but it doesn't exist yet. One of two things is gonna happen. Either we will succumb to the fear there are people that are so frightened, they believe they need a savior 
in the form of a pharmaceutical or a chemical that will save and protect them from this virus. Now, I want to be very clear, there may be some people that do need that support. If you are in, if you're watching this and you're in a high risk category, if you are vulnerable and susceptible, you may need that support and that's why it's there. And by all means use it and I'm not judging it. Is right, wrong, good or bad? A lot of people don't know they're in high risk. The, the, the factors for high risk that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Uh, obesity is a factor for high risk. Yeah. Diabetes is a factor, hypertension. Um, uh, high blood pressure, um, respiratory issues. All of these are factors that we're not often talk, talk, uh, taught about in, in addition to all the ones that we are. So, so some people are going to emerge feeling powerless, helpless, and they will emerge as victims. Mm -hmm. We also have the opportunity to take this time to honor the human body, to honor the wisdom and the intelligence inherent within our bodies for 200,000 years. We emerged on earth. This is unchallenged in science. They agree with this. 200,000 years ago, humans showed up. So we have had the mechanism to deal with every contagion that's come to us for 200,000 years. And we do for this one, if we have given our bodies what our bodies need to be at their best to do what they do so very well. What does that mean? It's all the things that we know about. Yeah. Nutrition. Are we giving ourselves the highest forms of nutrition at every meal, not just to fill the space in our stomach, but to nourish our bodies with food that comes from the earth, not from a machine or a factory? Okay, and that is a very deep and personal choice. Do we love ourselves enough to move? Movement is medicine. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are made to move. They're not made to be stagnant for days and weeks on end. Do we love ourselves enough to move in a healthy way every day. And people say, well, you know, I don't have time. So what you're asking yourself is, do I love myself enough to find 20, maybe 30 minutes every day to walk in nature? If I can, if I'm blessed enough to immerse myself in nature, and if the answer is there is no nature where I live, do I love myself enough to move, to do the yoga in your living room or in your bedroom or the floor exercises or the stationary bike or whatever it is, because that movement will stimulate and empower your immune system. We are made to be moving dynamic beings, not stagnant beings. Do we love ourselves enough to relieve the stress and the fear that actually depletes the very immune system that we so cherish and require right now? When we embrace the facts, the deepest truths of our existence, those facts go a long way in alleviating the fear because the facts are on our side. The facts tell us our bodies know what to do with a contagion when it comes into our bodies. And, and the facts are bearing this out. Now that more testing is being done, many, many people, up to 50% of the people being tested, test positive for the virus. They never knew they had it mm. because their, their immune system was tuned to do what it's designed to do. So in the background of their everyday lives, they're going about their lives while their immune system is battling this virus. Now, you know, maybe they're a little tired for a day or two. Maybe they, um, you, know, uh, you know, felt a little under the weather and, and maybe took a couple of days, you know, early naps or, or whatever it was. But they were not flat in an emergency room fighting for their lives. It's the people that are vulnerable and susceptible. Mm -hmm. So we're going to come out of this in one of two ways, and, and everyone has the opportunity. We're gonna come out of it as victims yep. looking for a savior in a chemical or pharmaceutical. We're gonna come out of it as masters mm -hmm. of our humanness reinforced with the wisdom from within our bodies that gives us the freedom to love and build the kind of world that we know is possible. And we are building a new world because the world we left a month ago is gone. That world no longer exists. Businesses are gone. Jobs are gone. Income has evaporated. Savings has evaporated. And we're going to be put to the test to build a, a new infrastructure and a new society based upon the values that we give priority to. to. And if we give priority to human life, if human life becomes the new priority and we align the technology to support that, we align industry. We align corporations to support that. We can't go wrong. If we come out of this and we haven't learned the lesson, 
mm. and we try to recreate what just happened two months ago that has led to this, um, at some point we'll find ourselves in the same position again. My sense, Julie, is that there are people that are going, both things are gonna happen simultaneously. Mm. We're gonna have a segment of the population that's gonna try to recreate what's familiar uh, and what is known because that's all they know. And there's another segment of the population that will recognize truly, literally, this is a global reset. And in that reset, I want to tell you why I'm, I'm so encouraged. I, <clears throat> yes, please. <laughs> I, I, I have a lot, a lot of irons and a lot of fires. I just uh, finished writing a paper uh, through a subcommittee at the United Nations who are asking the same questions right now. And when my paper was just was about what we're talking about right now, if we can put the, the principles of human life, specifically this was with regard to the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 2030. Mm. Uh, what do they mean to us? 17 goals identified by the UN, very ambitious goals, and they sound good, the goals. The question is the implementation. How do we get to those goals? If we can do it without, without losing, our very humanness and the principles of individuality and creativity and imagination. I think they're, they are beautiful goals. If we're going to sacrifice our humanness to get to the goals, it's not worth it. Yeah. And that, that is my input. Now, let me tell you on, on a global level, I'm seeing something happen behind the scenes and you're seeing a little bit in the mainstream. Mm. It's actually pretty cool. What you're seeing is this virus doesn't know about the borders between Iran and China and the United States or any other country. Mm. And for the first time, our leaders are being forced to see one another as more than armies facing armies and who has the best technology. They are looking at one another as men and women that have husbands and wives and children and families and as leaders whose leaders of nations literally hundreds of millions, in some cases, billions of lives are, are the responsibility of these leaders. And they're looking at themselves in this way. It's forcing that cooperation. My sense, what I'm seeing happening, is they are forced to cooperate because of the virus. Virus is gonna be gone some point down the road, and I think they will discover that they like that cooperation, maybe not 100%. Uh, you know, I'm a realist, maybe not 100%. But they're going to find that that cooperation helps them to have stronger nations, to be better people in a better world. And this may be the catalyst that moves us in that direction rather than keeps us separate, hiding behind our technology and our militaries. And I'm seeing that happen already. So uh, a lot of potential, I think, is, is what we're seeing in, in this pandemic. That it's saying I have an unstable, unstable connection, but I, I'm back right now. So you're back. Uh, so okay, can you can you hear me okay now? Absolutely. I was just so does that make Julie? Does does that, does that make sense? What I've just said oh, does, uh, yeah. brilliant. It's brilliant. I I, I love this. Uh, you know, we get to choose. Are you going to be? I love that the, the master of your humanity, or are you going to be a victim? And you know, just it's it's an inflection point is really the way I'm seeing it. Um, I love what you said about we're mm. made for times like this and the ways that we can dig in. Um, and it's about loving yourself enough. It makes me want to cry because, um, well, I did a lot of time not loving myself, and I think that mm. is the question. And and then changing the relationship around just human interaction with other humans in Iran and China and yeah. wherever. Really powerful. Uh, I, I, I want to be very, very clear uh, about, because it's easy to, for people to misinterpret yeah. what I'm saying about vaccinations. It's a big, a big topic right now. Yeah. If, uh, so they're looking at two pharmaceutical approaches. One is called prophylactic. It's, it's the vaccination, uh, hopefully to keep someone from uh, uh, succumbing to the disease and the medications after you are infected that help you to get through and, and survive the disease. If we are at our best as humans, those are not necessary. Okay. And I think there are many people that will not need either one. 
There are also people who are not at their best for a lot of reasons. If they are in vulnerable populations yeah. that we describe now, technically I am vulnerable by statistics because of my age. Uh, I'm in my late sixties. And what they say is in your late sixties that you, you have uh, your immune system is weakened. Now I want to be very clear. Is that possible? Absolutely. Is it necessary? My experience is the answer is no. Mm. I have physical every year. I went to have my physical in, in January of this year. And through my blood work, the doctor, my, it's a medical doctor that I go to for a baseline every year just to see where everything is. He said, Greg, I'm a medical doctor. I don't understand everything that you do because it's not my training. But he said, you, you have the blood chemistry uh, and the immune system of a man in his 40s. So whatever you're doing, it works for you. And I, I would advise that you keep doing it. So I'm saying it for this reason. If we do nothing and follow a traditional Western lifestyle, yes, that decline is possible. And if that is you, if you're listening to this and that's you, and you feel you need the support of those medications, those pharmaceuticals, do your due diligence. And if you feel that's going to help you, that's why it's there. But to require a perfectly healthy immune system to be exposed to, the, the, to those chemicals uh, and those pharmaceuticals when the need isn't there. Um, personally, uh, I don't think there's a need for it because our bodies know what to do and the statistics bear that out. 50% of the people tested are testing positive and never even knew they had it because they have a reasonably healthy immune response. So, and the other thing is, Julie, what the, the science tells us is our bodies are so intelligent that you have to be honest with yourself. I'm gonna invite our viewers and our listeners to be honest. If you ask yourself every day, every meal, do I give myself the, the, the best nutrition that's available in this moment? Do I love myself and honor myself enough to, to have the movement, to do something physical every day? Have I found the ways to remedy the stress? We all have the stress, but how do we resolve the stress in our lives? And if the answer to those is no, you've got some spare time right now because you're not doing a lot else. Your body will respond not in weeks and months, but in days. In days, the human body can turn those things around when we make the choices to, to love ourselves enough to honor our bodies and give our bodies what they need. So, I mean, it doesn't have, you don't have to go off the deep end, but just common sense, common sense the nutrition is very important and, and our soils are so depleted. Mm. Even if we eat the best nutrition, we don't get everything we need. We need supplements to go with that. Yeah. Now, a lot of medical doctors, one of the things I'm seeing on the medical bulletin boards that bothers me a little bit uh, is I, you know, I'm plugged into a lot of the scientific uh, bulletin boards, medical bulletin boards, and, and the medical doctors are discouraging supplements. And the reason they discourage them, they say the supplements don't kill the virus, so why take the supplements? For me, they're missing the point. Yeah. No, the, the, nothing will kill a virus, first of all, because a virus is not even alive. You right. cannot kill a virus. A virus is a pack of DNA surrounded by protein. It is inert. It's not even alive. That's why antibiotics won't work with a virus. It's a very, very bizarre concept. But number two, the supplements, they're not meant to kill the virus. They're meant to strengthen the immune system that can neutralize the virus when it's in our bodies. Ideally, we would get that from our food. We don't live in that world right now anyway. I hope we do at some point. Yeah. So we need those sup supplements and some supplements, uh, you know, vitamin C. Right. We're one of the only forms of life. We're one of the only mammals. There are five mammals that cannot create their own vitamin C. And mm. we, are, we are in that that small club. Mm. And I, I'm just going to throw this out. Ladies, if you're watching this right now, if you're a woman, even if you've never given birth to a child, if you've ever conceived in your womb, mm. your body kicked into a mode where you began creating vitamin C for your own body and for the body of the embryo in your womb for whatever period of time that embryo was there. And that tells us that probably at some point in the past, we could. But right, and then when you, your birth, when, when that embryo uh, was either full term or if you lost the child or for whatever reason, when it's no longer in your body, your body no longer produces the vitamin C. Mm. So, so we need external sources of vitamin C. Uh, 
one of the interesting things, I'm just going to ask, Julie, do you mind if we run over a little bit from? No, not at all. I have, I have, a, I'll save it if we have time for the question, but no, please keep going. I'm like, well, so, so this is, a, this is a media day. I have back to back interviews every 30 <laughs> minutes. Before this interview, I texted my next interview. It's a pre recorded interview. And I told them that I may run over a, a few minutes and they're fine with that. So, so I want to talk about vitamin C. Vitamin C is misunderstood in many circles. Uh, our bodies typically cannot tolerate a high dose of vitamin C as we typically understand it, through uh, rose hips or through ascorbic acid. Our bodies can't tolerate high dosages. Mm. If we give ourselves what are called ascorbate, A-S-C-O-R-B-A-T-E, the ascorbate precursors of vitamin C, we can then consume those in high dosages and our bodies will make higher dosages of vitamin C. And you probably already know, it sounds complex, but you already know those little packets of emergency is, is one of the E-M-E-R-G-E-N, mm. uh, -E -E emergent in the big letter C, made by a company called Alicer. Or uh, Trace Minerals makes uh, another one, 1,200 milligrams of C and Trace Minerals, 1,000 milligrams of emergency. You can take uh, higher dosages. You can take two or three packets of those a day if you feel the need. So you're getting two or 3,000 milligrams of, of vitamin C. There are mushroom extracts that our indigenous ancestors uh, have used. Agarakan is one, reishi is another, turkey tail is another. Uh, they are powdered, they are encapsulated. They are anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and antiviral. Mm. So here's, here's what that means. <clears throat> The virus that we're dealing with, we've all seen the pictures, it's a spherical virus with little protrusions. And there are properties called polysaccharides in those mushrooms that will blunt or disable hmm. those protrusions so that when they come into contact with a cell, they can't communicate with the cell. It's meaningless to the cell. So the virus cannot inject its DNA or its RNA, I'm sorry, in, into the, the, the cell because the, the little protrusions that it needs to dock. It's like a space shuttle docking with a space station. It cannot dock without those protrusions. And our indigenous ancestors have known this for a long time. Traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, right. uh, makes use of yin chow is another, it's a combination of, uh, of different flower essences primarily that do pretty much the same thing. So, so I'm saying that movement, exercise, a walk in nature, uh, anxiety. A lot of people are dealing with anxiety because they're afraid of the unknown. And this is the opportunity. If we hinge our sense of well-being on the external world, we will always be at the whim and mercy of the volatility of that external world. If we embrace and develop the deep truths of our humanness, that has served us for 200,000 years without any of those external factors to help us. I mean, the mushrooms certainly have been there. Uh, then we begin to take back our power and place our power on the, the deep knowing that regardless of what nature brings to our doorstep, we are literally wired, and I, I can even use the word designed, mm but it brings up a, a lot of implications that we won't be able to talk about in here <clears throat> in, this, in this interview, but I do in the books. Our bodies arrived on earth 200,000 years ago. We don't know where we came from. And we had all the systems already developed, already intact. They didn't develop slowly, gradually over those 200,000 years. Same systems we have today. When we compare our DNA with the DNA extracted from the fossils of our ancestors, this is what it's telling us. So we have the mechanism, we have the machinery. If we give our bodies what our bodies need, our bodies know what to do. And not only do we survive, but we thrive, we transcend. And that goes a long way in alleviating the fear and the stress and the uncertainty. We've done it before. There's no reason to believe we're not going to do the same thing right now. So for me, that, that helps a lot. And if you are vulnerable, by all means, use whatever is out there, whatever consciousness has created yeah. through the hands and the minds of scientists and engineers to sustain your life mm. so that you can make the changes 
and those no longer become necessary. So they aren't a crutch to be used throughout life. They are a temporary remedy to get you through a tough time. It's a very, very different way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Do you, would it be okay to ask you one, I have one more you yes, asked, yeah. yeah. We're, we're doing a dance and you're leading the dance. I just could go, I'm like, well, yeah. I could keep going for, for hours listening. And by the way, your video that you put together, the PowerPoint presentation was just uh -huh. exceptional. I'm going to make sure everyone has the link because I actually didn't know that this virus was dead. You go through the whole thing. It's so exquisitely. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Julie. You know, I, uh, yeah. we, we, my office, my team was receiving so many inquiries, phone calls, emails, texts, Instagrams, I mean, everything rather than answer them one at a time, I took about a week and, uh, and got the technical references and I did a small presentation because, and here's the, the honest truth, a lot of our community prides itself in not being plugged into the mainstream. Yeah. And by not being plugged in, and for good reason, because yeah. the, the news isn't true, uh, a lot, well, probably most of it now, mm -hmm. it's opinion, it's not news, it's not fact. So, but the, the, the flip side of that is they were not aware of how quickly the situation was unfolding. Okay. And all of a sudden, when stores were closed and they were not allowed to leave their homes and they couldn't get the things they need, they didn't understand why. And when they heard it was a virus, they said, why can't we just take an antibiotic and kill this virus? And for that reason, I put that presentation together. We've got about 1.2 million views now, so it means it's gone beyond our immediate community. Yeah. And, uh, and thank you for helping to support that. It's, uh, it's absolutely free, very informative. A lot of medical doctors have thanked me for putting that out there. Um, yeah, so uh, if, if you want to give a link to that, it's on YouTube, it's on my website, people can see it out there yeah. right now. 49 minutes and nine second running time. I was going to say 49, it was like 50 minutes or something. because I 49.09, yeah. Yeah, I had my husband, we were like, watching together we couldn't take our eyes off and i was like that felt like two minutes but i was like mm. that was 50 minutes it was really beautifully done and i will Thank have you. a link here Thank so you. i know your your book the wisdom codes is coming out and i just thought about i'm wondering if there are a few of the wisdom codes that you could share that might help with moving through this situation i just thought there might be a link um between what you're teaching and that book. yeah well there's, there's definitely a link um when that book was written, I had no way of knowing we would be in a global shutdown. Mm. Uh, the book took me 40 years to write. It is uh, based upon my experience of indigenous traditions and as a scholar, uh, what I've found in, in many ancient texts. So the bottom line is this. Our ancestors have always had very specific words and word patterns that they have relied upon for comfort, uh, for healing, uh, in times of loss, in times of fear, when they needed protection, and in good times, when they found love. Uh, they've always had these patterns of words. And my question was, why, why would they turn so consistently to these special chants or mantras or hymns that come from the Vedas, they come from the Buddhist traditions, from uh, the Gnostic traditions, the Christian traditions, the Egyptian funerary uh, traditions. So I pulled all of these very special words that I had to, this is volume one, there'll probably be a volume two because there were so many. But I pulled them together and I categorized them, Julie, into chapters like fear and loss and protection. But here's the science. What the science is showing us is the words that we choose. Now, so we think in words, we speak in words. The words that we choose determine not only how we think about our life situation, whatever life brings to our doorstep, not only how we think and how we solve the problems, but the words determine what we are even capable of thinking of. What we can even imagine or conceive is determined by the words that we use when we think and when we conceive, now we know that the reason is because those words are directly linked to the way that neurons wire and fire together in our brain and now we know in our heart. So this, this is important. The discovery was made in the 1930s. 
in the study of the Hopi language where there is no word for the past, there's no word for the future. Mm. Everything is in the present, it's alive, it's happening now. Mm. And in the Hopi worldview, everything is connected, everything is unified. Uh, and we are part of a harmonious continuum if we honor that connection. That's, that is the, the Hopi worldview. Our Western lifestyle is based in languages of separation. And that separation shows up in our relationships and the way we solve our problems, as well as in the way we think of, of ourselves in relationship to, to one another. So this, uh, I, I'm pointing here because I, I just received the hardback oh, in, yeah. in the mail. I'm, I keep pointing over here. So <laughs> I, I've got the, uh, my first hardback. Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> It's awesome. I can't forget it. There, there it is. Yay. There you go. Um, it, is, it is a collection of those words categorized in a way that makes it easy to turn to them quickly. So in, in the, the brief time that we have here, I, I will just say of all of those word codes that are possible, uh, the one that comes to mind right now, it is from the, the Navajo uh, here in the American Desert Southwest and their relationship to beauty. So we tend to think of beauty in a poetic sense uh, as, as an experience, uh, you know, a sensual experience. And, and it, it certainly may be that. But the Navajo see beauty as, as a force of nature like gravity or the electromagnetic force. And they have developed prayers and chants, uh, some of them rather lengthy that I describe. And, and the beauty prayer has actually been condensed into three brief phrases that I say to myself multiple times every day. It, it's become a foundation in my life since I discovered this for myself almost 30 years ago. Mm. So the three phrases are simply this. Number one, the beauty that I live with. Number two, the beauty that I live by. Number three, the beauty upon which I base my life. Mm. What this means, the beauty I live with reminds us that beauty is a force that already exists. We don't have to create it. Our job is to seek it out in all things, to find it in whatever life does in fact bring to our doorstep. There, there is a beauty in the pandemic that we're finding right now. And I've shared my perspective. One of the things I think it is, is it is forcing a new level of cooperation among global leaders that I believe will last on some level, even when the pandemic is gone. That's a beautiful thing, all right? And it's, it's inviting us to know ourselves in terms of what it means to be human because our humanness is what will save us in the presence of this contagion. So there is a beauty, the beauty I live with. The beauty I live by is our opportunity to use that beauty as, uh, as a guide stone, as, uh, as a light, that guides us through the choices and the decisions that we make every moment of our lives uh, and the way that we think of life and the beauty upon which I base my life is just that. If we allow beauty to become the, the lens through which we view whatever happens to us mm. personally, whatever happens in our relationships and whatever we happen collectively, if we allow the presence of that beauty to be there, we are changed in the presence of beauty. And in that change, we find the strength to transcend what life, what life is showing us. And that is one of the wisdom codes. Now, in the wisdom code, I, I talk about what it is, where it comes from, why it's important. Uh, for each one, I give an explanation, a description, some of the history, uh, and then how to apply that code in our lives. Now, one of the things I say early in the book, I'll say it here, we can't go into a lot of detail, Saying the wisdom codes is important. The state of consciousness that we are in when we say those words is where we find the true power. Mm. The consciousness, the state of consciousness that our ancestors used was what is called a coherence between the heart and the brain. Mm. When we bring our bodies into a state of coherence, we are primed for the code of the words. So you can think of it like a computer. Your computer has an operating system, right. uh, Macintosh or, or PC operating system. You turn it on, it doesn't do anything until a program is dropped into that operating system. 
the operating system is what is the fertile ground, if you will, that that gives meaning to that program when it's dry. If the, if the operating system weren't there, the program couldn't do anything. So our words are the programs that we drop into the fertile uh, and the, the, the pregnant potential of our human operating system. And when we optimize that through coherence, and I give the instructions, I talk about it, and you uh, are familiar with the heart math and, and a lot of the research that heart math people have done, I'm, I'm drawing upon that with their permission, yeah. of course. So, so the book talks about the power of that coherence to optimize these very, very powerful word codes that have given us comfort, protection, uh, and uh, helped us to get through as, as a human species, uh, the toughest things that life has ever brought to us. From the time that Moses climbed Mount Sinai mm -hmm. and was surrounded in a cloud that he didn't understand, the code of protection that he created then that became the code for entire armies have recited this before going in, into war, even in the 20th century. It's called the soldier's prayer. Mm -hmm. I include that here because for some mysterious reason, it has been such a powerful protection for diverse situations consistently for over 3,000 years. The Hindu mantras, Om Namah Shivaya, and the Gayatri mantra, and the, the Gnostic prayers, they're all in this book. So, mm. uh, so a very fast, fast overview, and that was a long answer to your short question. Uh, this is what the Wisdom Codes are all about, Julie. That was amazing. I... <laughs> All I can say is my 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 cheeks are hurting from <laughs> smiling. And I'm I'm so grateful that you for the luminary, the courage, the brilliance, the wisdom, and the um, just beautiful grace and humility that you exude. You are um, changing so many lives, and mm. we'll have all these all the links and information. I'm going to be getting that book ASAP. I know missing links is a great way to find out more about what's happening in the universe, like 200,000 years ago, some might be like, I didn't know humans started to you know, just you break yeah. a lot about that. Yeah. Well, it is. So Julie, we're going to close out here. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned your husband. I uh, know he's, he's in your life behind the scenes. Please yeah. thank him for sharing you with us Aww. for the time that you are. He's my brother, although I don't know him. So my brother, thank you, my brother, for all you're doing to make us a better world. And, uh, <laughs> This is our first time, Julie. I hope it's not our last. I look forward to the, the next time we can get together. And thank to you. my community, thank you all. Man, just thank you for mm -hmm. doing all you can do to be the best you can be for yourself and what we're going through. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through it together. We're going to have a better world. We're going to be better people. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, we're making those choices right now. And I think that's what's important to remember. Thank you so much. Thank you.